Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 600. Yes, you heard that right, 600 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and I'm so happy that you joined me on this monumental celebration day. Not really, to be honest, you know me, I don't celebrate Jack shite don't even celebrate my own birthday mate so i'm not really going to go over the top with this whole stuff but it is a great milestone nonetheless especially for myself being a um solo pod where i don't ever rarely interview people i don't really care to interview them because you have to ask them and then when you ask them i feel like the power imbalance is weird it feels like you're sucking them up to them when you don't really want to suck up to them you just want to ask them questions but then they feel like you're begging and now that i feel like i'm begging because i feel like i'm superior in all places even though i'm starting i don't have many viewers and stuff i still think i'm flipping amazing so it's always a really strange thing that happens there's still a lot of pride a lot of ego but i generally don't like asking people to come on this show because i like doing it on my own anyway and i also don't like asking because i don't like people to say no to me because i think i'm better than them to you know how dare you say no so there's that whole thing going there but regardless the fact that i got to 600 is absolutely mind-boggling especially when you consider that i started this show primarily as a way to kind of um <laughs> help me with my uh, mental health issues because when i was really young especially when i was kind of coming up in the scene streetwear scene whatever nightlife scene especially where i am here in london when i was like maybe 20 or 21 and stuff i went for a little bit of a crisis of confidence and stuff because i wasn't necessarily getting where i wanted to get to and i felt like i was better than everybody else around me that was getting the better things and i had a lot of the kind of comparison sort of like um you know thing in me right a lot of envy a lot of jealousy all that kind of stuff is happening so it's kind of eating away at me because i generally thought that i was better than everybody else around me which i probably wasn't and even if i was you know comparing myself and sniping other people wasn't really going to get me where i need to get to but i had a bit of a crisis of confidence but during that time i was also doing a lot of self-talk um to kind of cure myself right i tried to kind of talk to myself a lot and trying to g myself up and kind of be clear in my intentions and clear in my stuff that i wanted to do and my plans and my dreams and my aspirations and just was really really did that a lot and to the point where i didn't really pay attention to it it just kind of come I, I could i would just do it anytime so i didn't really notice when i was talking to myself so many people especially friends would like be like hey you're talking to yourself a lot you know you're all right so to come across i was going a bit nutty i was going a bit crazy so i thought as a way to kind of combat some of that self-talk i went to just kind of get all that stuff out of my head and kind of talk about topics that i would feel like would be I went to, especially in the beginning, I was mostly kind of talking about like career type stuff, um, kind of achieving your dreams, kind of loads of that self-helpy type stuff. But that was because I was going through that crazy time and I needed an avenue or an outlet to basically get all that self-talk, get all that um, internal chatter out of my head and maybe kind of um, through the process of maybe reading articles or maybe reading stories or profiling other people I could maybe heal how broken I was at that time and to be honest it really did work pretty well because this turned into being one of the most consistent creative projects I've done to date um, apart from maybe my DJing apart from maybe my, some of my writing but something I've, I've done like consistently month by month day by day year by year without stopping has been the podcast for sure and it's allowed me to do many other things it's also allowed me to kind of you know what's allowed me to do i think for the most part it showed me that i can be consistent because i think one thing about me that i don't really like is my lack of consistency i can sometimes take my foot off the pedal even though i got great ideas even though i can execute really well on a high level sometimes i don't have the momentum to keep going i'll just kind of you know get lackadaisical and get lazy and take my foot off the pedal even though i know i can go militant and do the whole 5 a.m wake up thing and all that malarkey um there comes a point in time where i generally do just start going oh, i saw right if i get up at seven today it's all right if i do eight so if i do nine and all of a sudden i'm not getting up at all so i'd like the fact that i'm just being consistent with this in terms of always is getting out a pod at least one time per week and that's been something that i've kind of been um helping on doing and so far i'm happy that i've kind of stuck to that kind of promise and also in, in general what it's also done is showed me that the small wins that i've kind of been able to make from making a podcast where at first i was getting like one to ten listeners on my main kind of podcast um video that i'd put up right because i think a video i started putting up maybe videos from like episode 300 or something before i was just recording audio but i would get like one to ten views on my videos alone just on youtube and then it got to a point where i kept uploading and i'll get sometimes you know high double figures and now towards the end i'm just now start, and now as i'm talking i'm now starting to get to like that good hundreds right the 200 pluses and stuff in terms of views into of the whole clip which is hard because i'm a nobody so somebody to sit there and listen to my whole entire hour 
is pretty much something that I can take as a win because I think the clips, you know, makes sense because I sometimes clickbait the titles. I put a good thumbnail on it. I'm talking about a topical issues, so that makes sense why people will check out the clips. But for someone to sit down and listen to my entire podcast, that definitely means that they're invested, definitely means that they're a fan of mine. They like the things I have to say and they want to support. So that's definitely a good sign that I'm kind of getting to where I need to get to. But in general, the fact that it's been slowly but surely going in incremental numbers, it's not crazy. It's not in the hundred thousands or the millions, which I'm obviously aiming to get to, but it's going slowly slowly but surely it also did give me a lot of faith in knowing that if you do start something from zero there is a possibility that you can get it to the highest of heights that you want it to because i think sometimes when you start creating projects it's hard to kind of allow yourself to fail you kind of always feel like you have to come in with like a preset amount of like sales or views or engagement and it's not always like that sometimes you might sell one t-shirt sometimes you might sell zero sometimes you might you might have two people buy tickets to come to your event sometimes no one comes to your event and you have to kind of be okay with that but the main thing the main point of it you know harking back to kind of you know what i kind of learned from virgil and wanting to carry on that part of his legacy the main thing i've kind of learned over these couple of years i've all these few years i've been doing this podcast is you have to make sure you get your ideas out there it doesn't matter how well it doesn't matter about how well they're finished or not finished you have to get them out there you have to ship and i think shipping is the most important thing especially for me i i've said it many many times but i have a lacy drive here right I have this, there we go, this lacy drive here full of ideas, full of stuff that never materialized, full of PDFs, full of line sheets, full of creative ideas for spaces, for brands, for commercials, for clips, for, for how to film things, like crazy stuff inside this lacy that's never seen the light of day. Because for the most part, I was always waiting for one thing, waiting to get a printer, waiting to get a camera, waiting to learn how to edit, needed a program, all these nonsense things I was thinking was holding me back when really the person was holding me back was me. I was the main person. And as long as you can ship something and get it out there, usually things fall into place. Like if you are waiting for a programmer to launch an app, why not ship something? Why not put together a white paper? Why not just try to make something within your means so that you can maybe send out a bat signal by you just putting a thing out there instead of just holding it to ransom and waiting for someone perfect to come along to kind of program it and make it for you. That's what I've kind of learned. And I guess from the program for the from the podcast for the most part i've kind of seen that many things have kind of come my way you know indirectly through it um obviously i've expanded my social circle greatly which has been great because i've said for before um i'm not really somebody that has many friends right i try to keep myself to myself but having a lot of people kind of listen to the show people kind of tuning in people leaving comments you know on the stream chat and stuff i'm sure there'll be people watching now when i put the premiere on later on big up all you people that contact me via dms and whatnot it's all really cool and it all really shows that you know oddly enough even though i thought i was a bit of a weirdo and no one was really into the things that i was into clearly there's a couple of people out there that are into the same sort of thing so it's really nice to have that kind of connection so big up everybody that's tuned in over the years i really do appreciate it. it's been a pleasure to have your company and let's you know let's kind of celebrate to um 600 more episodes isn't it 600 more <laughs> anyway um going on that I was actually contacted the other day by a journalist to talk about a topic that I spoke about on the podcast. I'm not going to mention which one it is. I don't want to put any more light to it unnecessarily. And it got me thinking, right, do I actually want to talk to this journalist to kind of like expand my reach and to kind of boost my profile in a weird way? Do I have to kind of get a bit of clout and promo for it? But then I realized not really, because especially how I've been paying attention to media and whatnot, journalists aren't really to be trusted in at all um people aren't to be trusted really unless you know them right you have to kind of get to know people but you can't really be going out there sort of like throwing your trust around willy-nilly and i think journalists for the most part are the main culprits that you can't be doing it for especially considering how besieged their their flipping industry is to flipping clickbait to engagement to fucking whatever it may be right um but there's obviously political motives behind some of these platforms too um that kind of lend them to kind of cover certain stories in a certain light and sometimes if you say certain things and in the wrong way or you uh, don't articulate yourself well then suddenly you are being cancelled for something that you obviously didn't really care about that much so that's why i probably that's why I didn't reply back, you know, kind of politely declined without really saying anything. And then I discovered this quote that maybe lends itself to my kind of way of thinking about things in general and maybe something you could maybe take away with you as well. So this is courtesy of Goodreads and it's by Lynn Barber and it says the following. I learn not to trust people. I learn not to believe what they say, um, but what they so I learn not to trust people. I learn not to believe what they say, but to watch what they do. 
I learned to suspect that anyone and everyone is capable of living a lie. I came to believe that other people, even when you think you know them, are ultimately unknowable. And I think this is an element to that. Obviously, like you meet some, you can learn some, you can you can know a lot about some people, especially your family and friends, people you've known for a while. But when it comes to like new people coming into the circle, it's not something I'm a big fan of, especially when it comes to new people who say that, oh, you can don't worry, you can trust me. Because I think the journalist said something on that kind of line, like you can trust me or something like that. And it immediately sent my alarm bells ringing. So I'm kind of glad I politely declined that request. But I do get quite a few of those kind of media journalist requests and I don't usually reply to them for the simple point is that I just... You know, I've kind of said what I wanted to say on this platform. Obviously, it might be beneficial for me to kind of get my voice heard on other platforms, but I don't think it would be, it'll probably end up hurting me more than it's going to help me. And I'd rather kind of people hear what I have to say in full context on here than hear it kind of be um, put through the lens of a journalist in their own words, clipped and edited and stuff. I, can't, I don't need that extra stress. I'm just a regular guy. I don't want to end up like that lady that ended up, you know, flipping, tweeted about flipping, maybe getting AIDS in Africa and then landed, when she landed, her whole life imploded. Do you know what I mean? I don't need that stress at all. Don't need that stress at all. But we have to open our show with um, some really tragic news, actually. It's all been happening over the last few hours as I've just been finishing up work. Um, it's obviously now been confirmed that PMB Rock, um, the well-known rapper, has unfortunately passed away. Um, he was a victim of a robbery um, in L.A. earlier today. And there was a video being shared on Twitter, actually a queer, gruesome video of him essentially lying in a pool of blood, being attended to by people that were in the restaurant. Um, and the story goes that he was in there with his um, with his lady and they were having some food before i guess they were heading home because that that chicken and waffle place is quite popular because it's on the way to the airport or something along that kind of lines and he was in there with his jewelry always watches on and i guess the lady um unbeknownst to her or you know not remembering how to move correctly um incorrectly decided to upload their location so basically tagged the location that they were at in terms of the roscoe chicken and waffles and then the story goes that the people that were watching her account basically then got the drop on them came to the restaurant to rob his jewels he resisted and they ended up shooting him and then taking his jewels anyway regardless so um that's what ended up happening and i guess when the video was out there a lot of people were hoping that he would pull through because he was taken to a hospital and he wasn't pronounced that i've seen but if you would have saw the video, you would have seen that, you know, he was really in a pool of blood. Like there was so much blood coming out of him. And considering how small and slight he is, you can imagine being shot more than three times, you know, close range um, in the chest. You wouldn't really imagine anybody would be surviving that. But regardless of all of that, um, it's such a shame, really, really big shame, because from what I know, PMB Rock, I'm not that too familiar with his music. Listen to a couple of his mixtapes here and there. But for the most part, one thing that I always got away, I got, I took from him, similar to like someone like a Russ, where maybe you don't listen to their music, but you kind of take away from them their personality and their humanity. And a lot of people had always good things to say about um, PMB Rock. Like, is he somebody that a lot of people in the industry have a lot of time for? Um, I'm sure he does a lot of writing and producing back in, behind the scenes also. But he just seemed to be somebody that everyone kind of had a lot of good things to say about. You didn't really hear a lot of people kind of hating on him for the most part. He didn't necessarily be, he, he didn't really strike me as somebody that was overly involved in gangs or sets or whatnot he was just kind of living his life making music and kind of living the dream and that's the really sad part of it because i feel like in some ways especially when it comes to hip-hop especially in la with the music being so intrinsically tied to gang culture it does make some sense even though it's still sad when people who are tied to the streets are kind of uh, unfortunately slain right it does make some sort of sense because the people they hang around with maybe because of crud they've done in the past i think i remember a rapper called little zay said that recently um he's got a song out at the moment with little dirk called uh, fuck my cousin part two i think and i think he said recently in a no jumper interview something along the lines of like um i think adam 22 asked him oh um so and so said this about you blah 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 and he's like yo i don't even want to know who it was i'm sure i have many enemies like you know i done i did a lot of bad stuff when i was coming up like before i started to take music properly i robbed people i jacked people i probably you know fucked with their baby mothers and stuff like he was very kind of adamant on it like that's part of the street life and i know it's probably gonna catch up with me or something like that right is it gonna catch up with me or i'm gonna be able to live to fight another day and I guess when you're a street guy, you kind of always had it in the back of your head, especially if, if you become a reformer street guy. You know that some people, you know, that you know that some things that you've done in your past that they they would never be forgiven, right? Especially if bodies were dropped and stuff. Um, but with PMB Rock, I never kind of got that feeling with him. 
Um, so it's really unfortunate this whole situation. But I'll read quickly the LA Times article. Um, rapper PMB Rock fatally shot during a robbery at Roscoe Chicken and Waffle. It says as follows: PMB Rock, the Philadelphia rapper best known for his 2016 hit Selfish, was fatally shot during a robbery at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles restaurant in South Los Angeles on Monday afternoon. Law enforcement told, sources told the Times, and allegedly, according to all people who live in that sort of area, that specific location of Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles is in the hood but it's also on the way to the airport so a lot of people um stop by that location to grab some food before they head out or to eat some food there before they head out so it, it you know there are various reasons why people like him would be somewhere like that but i guess that's the kind of sad part about it it continues los angeles police captain kelly muniz said that the, the shooting took place at 1 15 p.m at the famous e3 on main street and manchester avenue she would not identify the victim rock 30 whose real name is rakeem allen had been at the restaurant with his girlfriend who posted a location geotagged photo in a since deleted instagram post muniz said that the suspect brandished a firearm inside the restaurant demanded items for the victim sources told the times that rock was targeted for his jewelry he shot the victim and ran out the side door to a getaway car and then fled the parking lot when he said the victim was transported to hospital and pronounced dead at 1 59 p.m according to law enforcement sources lapd investigators are examining security video from inside the restaurant to identify the shooter they're also checking surrounding business to see whether security systems captured any images of suspect leaving on foot or in the vehicle knowing la and knowing how people are so hungry and knowing how people are so fame hungry and money hungry and all that malarkey it wouldn't be surprising if we end up seeing the video from the inside it's going to be troubling and horrible i'm going to obviously try my best to avoid seeing it because i don't want to see somebody lose their life it's horrible it's it's, it's better when you see those kind of videos and you don't know the outcome when you find out the person passed away flipping tears you apart but now obviously with somebody that i'm actually a fan of i wouldn't want to see a video like that so i'm going to try to avoid it at all you know at all costs but don't be surprised if this video does end up leaking um because i'm assuming all roscoe's have cctv inside so for sure there's going to be a cctv camera that picked up what happened exactly you know um from the from the time the guy went into the time the guy left it continues rock was born december 9th 1999 1991 so in philadelphia he told paper magazine he was inspired to make music at age of 19 after hearing drake's defining take here rock's ability to blend melodies with rapping had made him a natural fit for hip hop's next evolution he gained national prominence with his hit single called fleek turning the viral vine video into an anthem and for women uh, doing up the appearances across the street across the country sorry he went on to collaborate with bevy of artists including ed sheeran chance rapper on cross me one of the biggest moments came alongside atlanta rapper wife and lucci when the two joined forces for the 2016 for the victorious anthem every day we lit the song picked at number 33 on the billboard hot 100 the biggest chance song for either artist it's like what do you label yourself when you still infuse rap in your shit see top packing magazine people can't say i'm a rapper but i don't feel like i'm a singer either i'm not hitting super high notes and going crazy i can't give you chris brown singing i just got good melodies selfish peaked at number 51 on billboard 100 and rock released his latest single love me again in september the second now the really tragic part about this whole story involves obviously the girlfriend or the baby mother or the wife whatever um his lady essentially what's been going around now is people sharing pictures of her sharing a geotagged image of Debbie eating Roscoe chickens and waffles um, on her Instagram stories. And the story goes that allegedly the goons, I guess, had the drop on them through her Instagram account. They ran up into the store, so ran up into the restaurant, and that's what ended up happening in terms of him getting shot. So in a weird way, people are now blaming her for the shooting. Now, the unfortunate part of it is that it looks like in LA, considering all these high profile incidents that have happened from people getting robbed, and this is not only hip hop, there's, I've seen videos of guys getting pulled out of their cars and robbed for their watches. I've seen people getting robbed of their cars, white or black. Um, the guy who owns, what is that? Fashion Nova, one of those sites got involved in something also recently in terms of a jacking. Clearly there's something going on in LA. Maybe it's a poverty, maybe it's a post pandemic world. Maybe it's just people being hungry and starving in general, but there has been a real uptick in terms of the robberies that have been happening over there in LA. And it's safe to say that the robberies that happen in LA are very lethal. It's not like stuff you've hear in other states. Um, things don't, you know, people don't just beat you up and take your stuff. They beat, they, they take your stuff and they kill you or they just kill you and don't take your stuff. That's what happened with Pop Smoke, do you know what I mean? Sometimes it could be a robbery gone bad, then they just kill you just because. So 
if that's the case and you're somebody prominent or you're somebody wealthy you just have to move correctly you cannot move where you are doing what some people do where they share every minute play by play update on what they're doing with their lives on social media and i never understood that and this is coming from somebody that's on every single social media platform that exists um, but after a certain time you have to be a little bit more coy and a little bit more um reserved and kind of chill when it comes to your digital footprint or social media footprint you can't be having people knowing exactly where you're at minute by minute it just seems to me it just seems a bit lame it just seems a bit nosy and also in terms of just safety protocols it's just not the proper way to move especially if you're a female i'd imagine maybe as a guy you can maybe handle yourself a little bit better but as a woman you should really be careful about where you're sharing your location or especially sharing pictures maybe not geotagging it um, so people can't look exactly locate where you are um to the exact kind of point location and unfortunately if you're a rapper you just have no days off there is no such thing as taking it easy today if you're going to take it easy today you just have to stay at home you can't afford to move sloppy especially if you don't have security because there's one thing having security it's one thing not having your own gun on you it's one thing not having a bulletproof vest but if you're going to be moving around on your own you have to be moving around correctly that means not updating your social media on the go maybe updating your location and where you are at the day after maybe two days later i know i do it for myself there's a trend at the moment with a lot of people where they go on a holiday and they will purposely not update anything and update it all when they get back to make it seem like they were there far longer than what they were actually there for but there is just a general safety protocol thing about it for me where i usually would update my stories or my post like the day after do you know what i mean always a day after always kind of a day late so there's no kind of exact pinpoint time as to when i got there when i didn't get there so if somebody was trying something crazy nothing would happen that way because it'd be hard to pin what pin me down and then it also brings me to that last point in terms of just i'm i'm a real big believer in operating in the world as is like i would love to live in a utopia you know i speak about that often when it comes to dance music i I always sometimes have this really naive idea that dance music um or night clubbing or sorry or nightlife or going clubbing is a really great kind of platform to sort of create that kind of utopia where you can kind of make it the safest and best place that people can ever go to but i also aware that i've covered many stories here involving people in the nightlife industry who have done some really heinous crimes and what that's kind of awoke, what that's kind of made me realize is that for the most part monsters exist everywhere they exist in every part of our lives every part of our world every part of our society and it always will exist as long as we have uh, a, a somewhat of a god a uh, heavenly figure we're always going to have a devil somebody that's going to make people do bad and evil things if that's the case then you have to kind of move in the world as is and be aware and acknowledge that monsters are there to take advantage of any lapse in concentration that you have and once they do take that lapse in concentration your consequences could be lethal so instead of trying to just say oh i'm going to take it easy i'm going to chill no maybe be on point at all times because it legitimately could cost you your life and you know we don't know the circumstances around it maybe who knows somebody working at Wolf roscoe chicken and waffles maybe hit up somebody and told them hey i got the drop on flipping pmb rock he's here with all his jewels on you never know it might not have had anything to do with that girl's picture at all but in terms of how she must feel now just imagine how pmb rock's flipping lady feels if she's the one responsible for it especially when you look at pmb rock's latest um or last sort of twitter video that he put out where he's sort of driving around in a car actually his girl's driving the car and and he's kind of in a passenger seat flossing with his got with his shiny watch on and his nice chain like imagine how bad she must feel because clearly they were close enough where he'd share you know videos of her driving his car because you know how rappers are they don't really like to claim women unless they're really really serious with them so the fact that he was all she was all over his page made it seem as if they were very close i'm pretty sure they have a kid together also but that's obviously not guaranteed they're going to be close but still there's a video on his on his twitter now at the moment one of his last videos he uploaded essentially of them having a great time but you know unfortunately in this world you just can't move like that especially if you're involved in hip-hop especially if you're black especially if you live in la not even black if you're just prominent like i said i've seen videos of like white dudes getting pulled out of maseratis and people trying to jack their watches it's absolutely crazy over there in la and again i would love to actually know if anybody of my fans are um, from la what do you think the cause of this is because there's generally been a uptick in robberies and whatever there was a story obviously that kid getting shot outside of a sneaker store with some sneakers there was a story of some random girl i think works in a furniture store getting stabbed up by some stranger he just walked in and started stabbing her and obviously she unfortunately passed away there's this story that happened there's been some crazy stories obviously the pop smoke thing was obviously a really a big deal 
and it just doesn't seem to end. I wonder why, like what's going on, do you think? I'd love to know if you're kind of down there um, on the ground level to let me know what your insights are, what you've learned, what people are talking about, so I can, I can kind of have a little bit more insight on this. But regardless, RIP PMB Rockman, absolute young legend, gone too soon, taken away from us in an absolutely tragic way. Um, shouldn't have gone out that way. From what I've seen and from what I've heard, he was a really cool guy. He didn't deserve to go out the way he went out, to, the way he went out. but hopefully this also serves a lesson to other rappers out there that you have to move accordingly because like I said this guy wasn't heavenly entrenched in the gangs he kind of always rolled on his ones or on his own or with his kind of small group of team or with him according to people that I've read or listened to on the internet they've kind of said whenever they bumped into him away from the stage he would always like you know solo dolo or just a couple of people so he clearly was just chilling enjoying his life making the music that he loves so if it something like that can happen to him just imagine if you're somebody that's throwing up gang signs and shit and you're heavily you know uh, tied to the streets from that stuff you really have to make sure you move accordingly so RIP PMB Rock for some feelings go out to all his family and friends praise to his family and friends praise to his girl I hope she stays away from the internet for a long time six months or more because it's going to be absolutely brutal and there are people blaming her um, for his death which obviously is completely unfair but she hopefully she has a good you know team of people around her that can kind of tell her to kind of chill out and not be on the internet too much and yeah man just RIP man RIP what a tragic way to go what an absolute tragic tragic way to go I'm not sure some of you guys know or have heard, but allegedly one of the biggest YouTubers out there, le a very legendary YouTuber um, called Tana Mongo, is allegedly thinking of bringing back TanaCon. Most of you might be aware of it. You know, it's kind of a viral moment around 2018-ish, I think it was, um, where Tana decided to put a convention on as a response to kind of getting banned from VidCon. At the time, that was one of the biggest kind of conventions for YouTubers and whatnot, and loads of fans used to go there to meet their favorite YouTuber, take part in games and talks and all that sort of malarkey. And I guess kind of Tana got banned or maybe didn't get invited to that VidCon. And in response, she decided to then, you know, put on her own convention and called it TanaCon. And I think oddly enough thinking of it now that was actually maybe the genesis for all these other youtubers starting their own sort of events type things because i think a lot of people especially in that youtube space would see other youtubers do something if they did it well it was obviously be an, an, an inspiration for them to try it if they did it poorly it also be an inspiration to try it because they're like hey if tana who people don't really think is that intelligent could put together an event and it mess up as bad as it did especially according to um that fucking documentary by that big dude i forgot his name he put the documentary together but essentially she put the fest the con of con on it didn't do very well and it kind of you know it's essentially kind of ruined her reputation not until one youtuber came along and basically put together a documentary that kind of painted her in a much fairer light and basically showed that she didn't really have good people around her she was way over she was way over her head didn't know how to kind of get out of it and by the time the event happened it was too late to kind of turn things around but clearly it was a complete catastrophe now the reason why i bring this up is because there's very something very interesting i've noticed about youtubers in general which doesn't really exist i feel like in any other industry or any other sector of entertainment for some reason youtubers get a lot more grace from their fan base than anyone else because obviously youtubers for the most part i feel like don't have the threat of cancellation you can't really cancel youtuber because youtubers have to only rely or only have to sort of focus on their own fan bases right so there's no way you can actually cancel or take out a youtuber from the industry whereas you know similarly in, in, in the way that you could do to a like Hollywood actor right or like a t person that's on TV a lot because essentially if you cancel them it's easy because all you got to do is take away the agent and sort of like you know ex put a black mark against their name and no one's going to book them anymore and then all of a sudden they're not on TV anymore but when it's a YouTuber their audience and their fan base are viewers and as long as YouTube doesn't take them off the platform they're pretty much okay even if they get demonetized they can find other ways to sort of monetize and get money in but as long as they've got the ability to make YouTube videos they're basically fine there is no level of con con cancellation unless it's obviously a heinous crime but I'm also just curious to know what the forgiving nature is about youtube fans they'll get scammed they'll get hoodwinked they'll get sold a dream and then the usually the influencer will come back around and you know offer some half-baked apology usually with a pet sitting on their lap and suddenly everything is forgiven and the fan bases are pretty much okay of course they'll lose some fans along the way but for the most part the fans seem to be very forgiving and i'm not really too sure as to why so i decided to do a quick google or do a quick youtube sorry and just check out one of the news stories regarding tanacon to see was it really that bad as i remember it or am i kind of you know hyping up a bit but i think this little news clip courtesy of cbs Los Angeles definitely does show you or does show us that it definitely was as bad as I remember so let me play the clip now 
Yeah, you guys, when 20,000 people showed up at this hotel behind me for a venue that only fit 5,000 people, things went really bad really fast, and they even turned violent. They yes. tweeted that there was 20,000 people outside and the capacity is like 2,000. Moments before this gathering of YouTube fans turned wild, fans at TanaCon say an angry mob grabbed tickets and rushed the lobby of this Garden Grove Marriott, where Tana Manjo held her own event competing with VidCon. Jazlyn Damasco was in the lobby when she says she saw a stampede push through the front doors and trample fans and furniture. I got pulled by the shirt from security. I got Jesus pushed Christ. by a cop. I got pulled by the hair by a fan. <laughs> Police say hotel staff called them for help just after noon Friday. Over 20 officers showed up to safely escort fans out. One fan was taken by ambulance to the hospital with minor injuries. The security said, everyone, get outside. The event was shut down two hours after it started. Demosco and thousands of others paid $65 a ticket for the two-day TANACON. But there wasn't enough room to hold everyone inside. In tears, she called a friend to pick her up. I rushed over here, and as soon as I got here, I kid you not, there was children everywhere. I've never seen an event that was this poorly planned out. When I went inside, I thought I was going to have a really good time. Like, I'm going to be all my favorites. And that never happened. These Bless Tana her. fans never even made it inside. We stood three hours in the heat just to be told to go home and check back tomorrow. And you drove all the way from Utah, 11 hours. Jesus so you're come Christ. Back tomorrow if they do this again? Absolutely. <laughs> See? That, to me, was a perfect way to end that clip, right? After all the nonsense you heard, after people getting trampled, the, the poor young lady talking about her hair getting pulled, getting showered out by security guards. Because imagine, all these girls are, like, under the age of, what, 22, right? Between the ages of, like, 70 to 22. So imagine being shouted at by some big, aggressive guy. Um, you probably never get shouted at that even at home. You suddenly get blared at. You're on your own. The sun is beating down on you. There's not a lot of shade. There's, not, there's no refreshments. You have no idea what's going on on and you're getting blasted at by the security guard obviously it's gonna be quite scary but at the end of it they're still like super fans they're still stands for the most part um to the point where all that bad stuff was said and then they go out right at the end right at the end right at the end when they said would you come back again right here right back at the end here from utah 11 hours so you're gonna come back tomorrow if they do this again absolutely that essentially is what enables youtubers to get away with murder because essentially they're fans <laughs> generally genuinely genuinely do not care they're in it for the long haul they're in it for the ride which i feel like a lot of fans are like that i think even hollywood fans the fans of hollywood actors and actresses and whatnot and people on tv sitcoms and series and whatnot i think the ones that get cancelled even the stuff like to do with army hammer i think if you had to poll his actual fans i don't think they turned off from him it's just more so the industry decided hey what you did was too much is heinous we're gonna get you out of paint and they're the ones that sort of cancelled in the industry, which is I'm always not been a fan of. I think it's crazy to say, and it's a very controversial statement to kind of, it's a controversial position to hold, but I've always kind of believed cancel culture that way I don't really like in terms of industry blackballing cancel culture. I'm a big fan of more so your fans deciding if they want to cancel you or not. Your fans being the one, hey, you're obviously taking the piss. You don't deserve this fan base. You don't deserve to have a career doing what X, Y, and Z. We're going to stop buying your tickets. We're going to stop attending your shows. And if that person then disappears into the night, it is what it is. But this idea that industry whole you know industries can collude like even the stuff with andrew tate the same sort of thing can decide okay you don't get a platform and then they all kind of follow suit and delete every single profile that you have on their platform too so it kind of removes your voice from the internet that i'm not a big fan of at all in my opinion but i'm just fascinated always have been by the ability of youtubers to be absolutely terrible people to treat their fans like absolute dog crap but still have them queuing around the block i have no idea how that happens how you create that but i guess maybe it's a more so maybe it's like a because you watch them so often and because you feel like you know them there's more chance to forgive them because you know that's how you are with your friends maybe it's like that i'm not really too sure because or it might be just an extreme version of a parasocial relationship right where you legitimately feel like you know them to your core like they're your family and you want you don't turn your back on family do you so who knows but regardless tanacon is meant to be coming back i'm sure we're going to have many many youtubers covering it i'm sure it's going to end up being a complete shit show anyway because for some again the last bit on this as well 
TanaCon could have been a success, especially if you watch a documentary. I mean, Shane Dawson, that's the guy that made it, Shane Dawson. For the most part, you saw somebody that clearly didn't delegate well, didn't have good support network around her, was obviously somebody that couldn't say no to certain things, it wasn't very decisive, not really a business person, all that, blah, blah, blah. But there is an opportunity for those YouTubers who have a big following um, of kids who don't mind spending money or don't mind spending their parents' money. There is an opportunity to make those kind of things successful. But you need to delegate and you obviously need to kind of link up with somebody that can already do, that's already done those kind of events so they can just kind of put your face on it or put your branding on it or something. That's probably the best way to go about it. But I guess these YouTubers are so money hungry um, that they see the numbers for how much it would be, how much they would make if they did it on their own v how much they would make if they did it with like a production partner and they just always try and do it on their own because they feel like they got the resources they've got a friend who knows how to do this a friend that does that somebody hook up all these weird hookup things but really if they just linked up with a production company and said hey an events company hey i want to put on this convention could you or even a convention company who knows and say how can you help me do it? How can I execute this at the highest level and then kind of run it that way? It'll be a complete success. But I've got a funny feeling that it won't happen. History will keep repeating itself and we'll get an absolute shit show and we'll, um, you know, people like myself, commentary channels that kind of feast on this stuff will be um, very well fed for the next few months if this does end up happening. But yeah, TanaCon is due to be coming up very, very soon. So keep an eye on it. Keep an eye on it. Next, we have some news courtesy of Bloomberg regarding Kanye West. And I, for one, am happy with the headline. I haven't re have read the whole article, which I'm going to read as we go on with this story. But the headline alone makes me smile, especially considering the stuff that I've been speaking about when it comes to Kanye West and some of his rants that he's been going on against Gap and Adidas. So the headline says as follows, Kanye West is done with corporate America. He'll go at it alone. The sub headline says the rapper and designer is sticking to his current contracts, but says that's it. No more corporations. So no more companies standing between me and the audience, which I'm super happy about because I've said it for the longest time, for the longest, longest time, especially more so recently. Kanye's recent rants against Adidas and Gap, although they were all warranted for what we can tell from what he was talking about in Gap again, because you, you can't take everything Kanye says as gospel he's never always telling the truth it's always his version of the truth that's going to best suit his needs and as a Kanye stan as somebody that's been obsessed with the guy as somebody that used to rush home to listen to his quote-unquote rants that used to go on um during his stage shows somebody that bought loads of his merch or, you know attended his shows listened to his albums I can generally do say over the years my kind of impression of Kanye has slightly changed as a person but what I can't do understand about the dude when it comes to him talking vocally about these big obstacles that he's faced or these challenges he's facing in terms of his business and getting his ideas out there usually there are elements of the story that aren't exactly always true but help to kind of further his point and help him to get to a point we need to get to and ultimately it's a point that's going to help everybody so even if he is lying it doesn't necessarily matter because in the end his kind of um willingness to kind of be so vulnerable and talk about these sort of things in public will end up helping kids coming up when they end up doing um business with big corporations if they want to start doing design all that sort of good stuff but um, from what we can understand of his issues with Gap, he didn't really have as much control over um, what they did and how they launched it in terms of, you know, putting on the fashion show, in terms of putting out ads, in terms of filming commercials, in terms of putting out more product, in terms of what a product would be dropped, pre-orders, all this sort of stuff he was in control over. And then when it came to Yeezy and Adidas, I think he said that he, Adidas tried to buy him out of the contract for a fee that he didn't think made sense because I think he said the fee was somewhere around 1 billion they said he was going to be making on royalties alone 500 million so obviously they were trying to undercut him and get him out of that deal because you know usually from what i've seen shoe companies don't like paying people royalties you saw it already with um stefan janowski right the guy that's got the sbs if i'm not mistaken a few years back um nike bought him out of the contract like for a massive fee i forgot how much it was but before that he was getting royalties on every shoe sold and if you know anything about skateboarding or you know anything about sbs or you know anything about sneakers in general you know those stefan janowski's for a few years were one of the most popular and most well-worn shoes that you'd see everywhere especially within the sort of youth market whatever they were really really intrinsically tied to the skater intrinsically kind of popular with from nike so you can imagine how much they were having to pay him a royalty so clearly they didn't want to continue doing that so they just kind of offered him a kind of um life-changing amount of money that he willing to willingly took up front because you know it's better to take the lump sum up front than maybe to wait for the royalties but who knows um so clearly both situations for Kanye have been tricky to deal with but my main point when I was speaking about it prior was that I feel as if like Kanye 
even though he's got all these years of experience working in the industry, he's had many ups and downs, many deals, many whatever, for some reason he still hasn't got it through his head that corporations are always going to cooperate. They're always going to do what they do best and that is fuck over creatives. And I've been really adamant, especially myself and in my journey and the things I want to do, that if ever I had the opportunity to work with a corporation, one of the main things that I would do stipulate is the term of the contracts in terms of length and in terms of deliverables but it'll be a very short contract it'll be a very you know anywhere between a year to five years and with some key deliverables we'd shake hands on the end of the day and then walk away you know so we'd shake hands on it and then at the end you know we'd make sure we kind of we're both happy with what we got and then go our separate ways but there'd be no kind of um There'd be no kind of naivety on my side in terms of thinking I can come in and reshape this company and pull it kicking and screaming into the 21st, 22nd, 21st century. No, it's not happening. Corporations are always going to cooperate because for the most part, corporations are run by soulless, vapid, you know, lacking in creativity people. Hence why they got you in for the first in the first place. But they also don't really think creativity is that important because for the most part, they've been able, especially a company like Gap and Adidas for, for the most part, they've been able to kind of get by on just selling kind of basics you know what i mean on kind of getting by just through just pure legacy alone so for someone to come in like kanye and want to kind of tear up the the, the kind of playbook to fundamentally change how they do retail to change how they do pr- pr- uh, um, marketing to change how they do manufacturing all that kind of stuff um just to kind of showcase the words that he's doing it wouldn't make sense to them so i was under the impression that for whatever reason Kanye doesn't seem to understand that and he's still kind of trying to fight against it but I also thought to myself it's maybe a good thing that he's so adamant on trying to change how corporate america works because maybe he might be foolish enough to actually make it happen and then like i said before other generations or people will end up kind of um kind of enjoying the fruits of his kind of struggle but it looks like finally he's decided to kind of do the sensible thing and not waste his energy trying to change corporate america and instead learn his lessons that he can take from it and apply it and just try and go about it himself especially nowadays especially considering the amount of leverage he has the amount of money he has the amount of access he has the amount of flipping um you know uh credit in the bank he has from the work he's done prior this is the perfect time to take advantage of it and try to see if he can do it on his own kindness you can't do everything on your own this isn't some sway thing what's why he's doing everything and you can't do everything and you need partners you need people you can work with who can do things that you can't do at the highest level to get the stuff out to the most people you can get it out to which has kind of been Connie's modus operandi right he wants to get high quality garments out you know designed by some of the best minds in the world to the most people possible so everybody's basically dripping cool great admirable um but now take advantage of those resources and access that you have and get those things done instead of trying to trying to pull these corporations in to the 21st century when they clearly don't want to be there because they can get away with just being mediocre and doing a pretty decent job of it they can make sure they put their kid through private school they get their you know their yearly vacation all that good stuff so it's they've got no incentive really to change those things going forward but anyway let's read this article and see what they're saying it says as follows um rapper and designer Kanye West has now goes by Ye says he's done with corporate America his quote says as follows it's time for me to go alone Ye said in a phone interview it's fine I made the company's money the companies may be money we create ideas that will change our apparel forever like the round jacket the thumb runner the slides they've changed the shoe industry now it's time for Ye to make the new industry no more companies standing between me and the audience I love to hear that I love to hear that and that's true though he has made some absolute wins in his short career um um, within the kind of clothing manufacturing kind of industry right all those kind of wins he's listed have been pretty monumental it continues even with billions of dollars in revenue and two of the most fashion industries most lucrative uh, royalty deals at stake Ye has now shown um, full willingness to publicly battle the very same corporations he's worked most closely with but there are some obstacles to too clean to but there are obstacles to a clean break um, foremost are his high profile long term arrangement with Adidas to produce sneakers like Easy Boots 350, which expires in 2026. That's not really that too long, only four years. It's all right, isn't it? <clears throat> Um, and the apparel agreement that will gap which ends at 2020 2030 sorry 2030 sorry and they all just have to get along he says as follows which is my best quote i love in this entire interview they are my new baby mothers 
um, says Ye. I guess we're just going to have to co-parent these 350s. Absolutely incredible quote. A representative for Adidas and Gap declined to comment. Ye intends to open his own Dondo campuses, named after his famous, his late mother, sorry, across the country, which will house shopping, schools, farms, and dorms all together. Products sold there will be unique to the Yeezy's physical and online shops um, and designed by existing Yeezy staff. He said he's working with former Adidas executive Eric Ledecht, who now runs an independent plant-based clothing operations and less clothes collective. Um, in recent weeks, he has also been urging potential job candidates with expertise in operating retail networks to reach out to him. He also has been operating Yeezy Supply, the e-commerce shop that serves as a primary resale point for all Yeezy goods, hitting the market in the endless stream of series of drops. Adidas and Gap have, have bet big on Yeezy, counting on Ye's label to boost the cachet among the young demographic. Adidas top executive Casper Rodster plans to step down next year, and Gap boss Sonia Sin is ousted in July. Gap has entered match. Anyway, so he says, Follow Ye has repeatedly called out Adidas and Gap and has requested to be added to their board without success. If I argue with somebody broker than me, the only outcome is that I get broker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love it. Um, but yeah, so that's that's basically the, the the entire function of it. So clearly, I think somebody smarter um, and you know well educated and maybe with more money than I has finally got to Kanye and said, "Hey, you're fighting a losing battle. You're never going to win these, against these corporations. They have their own vested interests. They're sort of looking after, and you don't really serve that in any way, shape, or form. Much brighter and more influential people than you have tried and failed. You're not going to make any headway. And also, just in general, forget if you'd make any headway. Just in terms of creativity and energy, and you know, auras and." chi and all that mal malarkey you can't be wasting all of that especially being as creative as he is on trying to fight these corporate battles uh, maybe leave it in the hands of a lawyer or something but Kanye should be out there kind of making and sort of developing and making and putting into action and putting into reality his ideas he shouldn't be arguing with corporations because that's not going to go anywhere and plus he just doesn't have the tact and the kind of um, way to talk to them really well he seems to approach everything like a roasting session and I would imagine executives middle manager executives and stuff or boardroom level executives don't you know take too kindly to be mocked and being insulted online so it makes sense why this probably isn't a tactic that's obviously worked for him in the long term but hey at least it gets their attention at least it gets their attention so moving on from that we have news here or a little clip courtesy of a recent event that happened at nike um they had a event i think that's meant to be honoring people that work within nike it's all like their award ceremony thing which is quite a nice little touch to be honest to kind of thank the people inside the company that have done great work blah -de blah 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 and they decided to invite drake there to present some awards and to obviously do a little bit of a row session and just hang out on the campus and take part in all that good stuff and i think travis scott was there also so it's a full day's event type of thing and drake decided to do a little comedy bit basically roasting kanye roasting adidas a little bit of new balance thrown in there and something about um tiger also but the takeaway from this is people thinking that drake was dissing kanye by the joke he made about kanye here and regarding adidas which i don't think was a kanye diss it was more so a diss against adidas and just generally an observation of what's going on in culture because for the most part from what we know um drake and kanye are back cool again i don't think they aren't cool again um all of a sudden out of nowhere because i think we would have heard about it by now um so i do think this is just like a harmless joke um that was said but it is quite impressive how funny or how tight drake's material is compared to other sort of stand-up comedians that you might see you know with specials out there especially ones that have more out on youtube and whatnot that are under 30 minutes it's definitely much better than that so let's play the video i've obviously grown up um with this check on me i don't know if you can see it it lights up this jacket belonged to um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really, a, it's really truly an honor. And when you put things into perspective, you know, Adidas has Kanye, I think. Uh, <laughs> Nike, we have LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Giannis, Michael Jordan, the greatest creative mind of all time, Virgil Abloh, rest in peace. We have Cristiano Ronaldo, we have Serena Williams. We have Tiger, and I'm pretty sure Reebok has Tiger, so we're good. Um, everybody, let's keep it rolling for another 50 years. My name is Drake. Thank you for having me. Pretty good, isn't it? It's a pretty good little research. I'm not going to lie. Number one, 
the jacket is pretty hard. It's like a Nike jacket with some LED swoosh on the front and the back. I'm assuming it's a vintage piece that he's probably been able to pluck out of there. Um, from what I understand, he's working with some kid, I forgot his name, who's on Instagram, who's known for kind of pulling and getting a hold of, you know, vintage and archival pieces and whatnot. And, um, you know, if you've seen kind of Drake wearing some interesting pieces in terms of combat pants or skateboard t-shirts and shit, I think that's the reason where he's got, that's the reason, the place where he's got it from is that kid. I think he's been helping him out. And of course, that fucking mug from Hidden and Wise also been helping him out get some stuff also i think i remember him saying something on a clip somewhere that he was helping i think he sent drake a pdf or so an excel sheet full of flipping items you should probably buy that are quite cool because there's one thing about drake that he quite good at is that he doesn't pretend to be cool i think the person that's actually cool and got their finger on the pulse is oliver the guy that's obviously i think maybe the kind of overall creative director of ovo but drake never really tries to pretend like he's cool he doesn't necessarily look cool he's not necessarily into or knows most of these brands or whatnot he just wears what's nice but it is good that he does delegate so he does get kids involved who clearly know what's up obviously his connection and friendship with little yeah probably helps too because that kid's always kind of dripped up and all that malarkey um so that really does help in that regard um then obviously there was a clip that went around that showed his braids and he had a nike kind of braid put in swoosh into his hair which was really corny really lame but again drake's mixed race so we shouldn't really be suspecting anything more than that but i thought the bit was really good i saw i thought the little stand-up special thing that he did was re really impressive very tight but we should we should also be surprised because i remember he did like a similar sort of thing at some nba award type thing and he absolutely crushed it so clearly the guy's got jokes clearly the guy's got good timing got good stage presence and it's just a kind of proper multi-hyphenate he's like this era's version of like a jamie fox he can do it all right he can act sing rap um maybe not dance as well but he's definitely got everything into one you could imagine if drake does decide to retire from rapping and whatnot he'll make a decent actor especially considering his work he did at the grace the grassy story and just looking at music videos he's put together and how he's acted in them he's just got the he's got that it sort of factor when it comes to acting and whatnot so clearly there's something there but pretty decent little thing they did there for their employees i'm not going to lie um it must be nice to have your you know the place your employer basically acknowledge the hard work that you put in even if you don't win i think these things why they're so good it's like when they do sometimes like workplace that i've been where they have like events where they sort of celebrate people and give people awards it's not for you to win obviously it's great if you do but it's nice to see other people that you've also records usually there's people that get recognized who get awards that's quite obvious who's going to win them because we all know who the hard workers are we all know who the people who mid burn the midnight oil the ones who aren't afraid to take on more responsibility the ones that lead with compassion and care blah, blah, blah. we all know we've seen them in our workplace so usually it's never like a surprise who wins something but it's just nice to see them be acknowledged because it kind of tells you subconsciously that you know if you work hard also you'll also be noticed and you'll also be awarded uh, or rewarded when it comes to those kind of events so it's quite nice to get that well to get that kind of good team spirit kind of seeping through the company and people are knowing that your hard work doesn't go unnoticed people are watching and seeing and noticing it all the time so i do love these kind of things as corny as they are i'm a big fan of them i think they really do a good go a long way in terms of boosting um you know employee morale overall Next, I want to talk about this quickly because it kind of is a bit of a bee my bonnet. So most of you are aware that these Jordan 1s are due to be coming out very soon, right? They're the Air Jordan 1 Lost and Found Chicago Reimagined. And as you can see here from the opening picture taken from Sneaker News, the idea behind it is that you take an Air Jordan 1 and you essentially distress it artificially to make it look like it's a Jordan that you plucked out from some dusty mom and pop somewhere, uh, pops, some dusty mom and pop shop somewhere that's been lying there since 1985. So you've got the crackled um, leather here on the collar, the top, you've got the kind of dyed midsole there to make it look like it's been yellowed once it's been in the box obviously the polyurethane sort of like wearing away then you've got the white sort of stains on on the outside that you're all kind of familiar with you've got a few smudges here on the upper as well to kind of give that effect so you know the standard sort of vintage effect people do but from what i've kind of understood it's essentially been um 
made from the reference of an old 1985 Jordan, which I don't believe because the shape is completely different, but they've essentially gone to great measure to make sure these look similar to a 1985 Jordan. They've added, obviously, the pre-distressed marks on it, and they've also gone the extra way by adding a distressed box that's similar to boxes that you would find if you were to pick up this shoe, you know, many years after the fact from a mom pop store, especially since the top of the box has been sort of like um, exposed to light and it's darkened out a little bit, or some, sorry, the, the edges have darkened out, um, have faded out, sorry, due to being exposed to light and all this good stuff so it's a pretty interesting and a cool way to go about things but the thing that really sort of pissed me off when i saw this number one is the fact that the shape is just like in any any other jordan one that you would get high but i guess the materials have been improved and obviously the finish is quite nice so it's not that dissimilar to any other jordan that you would have bought in over the last few years australia jordan one you've bought the last few years but the thing that really annoyed me the thing I really got under my skin was this little note they're going to be sticking on the inside. So on the inside of the box, they're going to have this little um, invoice receipt type thing that you would have kind of been aware of if you were maybe gone to your shops back in the day or maybe you went to a store that didn't have like an electronic till that you sometimes fill out the receipt by hand and give you the receipt on like a little bit of parchment paper. It's like, a, you know, it kind of transferred onto the sheet underneath. And then of course they filed the other one for their records when they do the accounting. But the reason why this really annoyed me because this obviously takes a nod at the sort of like mum and pop stores where you would be able to maybe find these shoes back in the day or maybe if you're kind of buying them after the fact, it would be a good place to go find vintage shoes after the fact because this is where, you know, a lot of those shoes were sold but maybe not people didn't know and they had loads of dead stock down in the stock room. Now, the issue for me about this whole entire thing is that from working in retail and from being somebody that worked in various shops, shops in London, especially during the trendiest time of sneakers and streetwear and whatnot, one thing that I knew that Nike were really sort of like stern on was stores and limiting the amount of stores that were able to sell limited edition tier zero kind of like, you know, shoes that people wanted and went to queue for, went to flip and all that stuff. And what they initially done, from what I remember, is that a lot of these independent stores, because that's basically what mom and pop stores are, right? Or were before, you know, now they're basically a different name. They're basically indie stores. But essentially, these mom and pop stores, they were basically forced into a position where they had to buy large amounts of other Nike product, other mainline stuff that they probably couldn't shift in order for them to have the chance to be able to purchase some of that limited edition stuff that they knew could sell. So as your mom and pop store, you were caught in a weird predicament because you knew you needed to get the latest Jordan. You needed to get the latest whatever it may be air max because that was the only way you're going to increase the foot flow into your store and i'd imagine a lot of retail stores they have a real big um onus or they kind of are really pushy about making sure they can get people inside the store because they know that's the only way they're going to increase sales across the board if you have an empty store you know it's pretty obvious to know that you're going to not have that many sales but if you can get people in just even if they're going to only buy that limited edition shoe you never know what they might also pick up along the way out so those kind of releases were really big um, or really big kind of money earner or it was a big way for them to kind of just get people inside the store. I know same thing used to happen with like Nike SB stores too, right? They'd have the same sort of issue as well. They'd have to buy all these other mainline SBs that would never ever sell. But then the only time the shop was full was when they dropped a limited edition Nike SB. So it was really kind of annoying. So essentially over time, I felt like that Nike policy and maybe changes in the economy essentially single-handedly led to the um, demise of mom and pop stores. And then later on, this same strategy also led to the demise or, or the conventional demise that we would see of a kind of um, independent store. Think of something like a foot patrol, right? It was once independent, then it got brought out by size and now it's turned into essentially an independent, a, 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 an independent, no, it's turned into like a major high street store cosplaying as an independent store because it's basically owned by JD Group. So there's nothing really indie about it whatsoever, but obviously because they do cool things, cool collaborations, and they let it kind of operate on its own little island, um, it can kind of seem like it's it's more than what it is, but it really is just a mainstream kind of high street store that's kind of like draped in a sort of um, independent camo. And I feel like this is really done in bad taste because like I said, I feel like they were responsible for killing mom and pop stores. And now many years later, they're now trying to you know give them a nod and give them credit and shine some light on that whole entire era by putting the slip inside of the box of a shoe that doesn't even look like it's been made in 1985 it just looks like a shoe that's been stained nowadays so it's really really poor in that regard but again you know corporations are also always are gonna what always gonna cooperate so i shouldn't be that surprised i shouldn't be that surprised
as most of you guys would know, I'm pretty sure some of you guys have already seen this before, but I wanted to talk about it regardless. So I have my um, POV or opinion on this on record. So Kiff had decided to link up with Jerry Seinfeld to showcase their full 2022 collection. And yes, you heard that right. Jerry Seinfeld is modeling Kiff clothing. Now, the shoe itself isn't that bad from a kind of just, you know, far away looking type of thing. The fits obviously fit, I think, Jerry well. He tends to wear it pretty decently. Um, it doesn't look that crazy on him. But still, the fact that it's Jerry Seinfeld dressed in the clothing that he's dressed in and dressed in a company that I think, you know, still was maybe trying to be somewhat cool is a little bit corny and a little bit cringe. I'm not going to lie. And if anything, this one thing this does, this, this, this one thing this sort of like lookbook does for me is confirm this infatuation or this grip that streetwear seems to have with people of a certain age, especially when it comes to people that work in the industry. Because I feel like this is something that definitely came more so from Ronnie, the kind of owner of Kif, as opposed to people that work around him. I don't think maybe some of the young folks that maybe work at Kif would even know who Jerry Seinfeld is, not to the nature or not to the extent that um, Ronnie would in terms of his relevance to culture, in terms of maybe some of his um some of his kind of uh style moments that maybe lend itself to people who are in tune with sneakers and streetwear that maybe haven't seen old images of him on Seinfeld wearing a particular sneaker that was clipped up and put somewhere but I don't necessarily think that was him being swagged out. I just think it was him just living in that era and wanting to buy some trainers and those are trainers that are available. I don't necessarily think that made him to be a sneakerhead but regardless that sort of like romantic vision that people have of Jerry Seinfeld would only come for people who obviously are old enough to remember Seinfeld and the significance back in the day in culture but I feel like now that if you're a kid coming up there's no way that you would care or give a shit about what Seinfeld's about but people in the industry that work behind the scenes they probably identify themselves way more with Jerry Seinfeld than they would some random kid on flipping TikTok do you know what I mean so maybe it does make some sense that they'd get him on board but for me this also reminds me of why I decided and I'm so glad I took a step back from the industry and the scene in general and just kind of treated it more so as something that I kind of watch from afar as I do here on the podcast. But then I make my money in a completely different industry. I then spend it and buy the things that I like to buy, but I don't need to be in it. Because I remember for a long time, I thought like in order to kind of take part, I had to kind of be there as well, working these shitty retail jobs, um, trying to intern for companies that clearly didn't want interns <laughs> or maybe didn't want me at the time trying to maybe get real jobs in these big companies and also they're not ever be openings because the old people that work there never left so that was always so when i see stuff like this it just reminds me of adult hype beasts that i've worked with or seen in the industry people who work for like some of the big kind of sports brands or clothing um streetwear brands out there at the moment who have been in the same role for 20 plus years and just won't give it up there is no point in them they, they don't see any point in them retiring there is no kind of exit plan it's just a continue continual cycle of going to paris fashion week of going to this convention over there of going here of going to studios of seeing this drop of going to the store opening it's just a constant circle of this sort of like clout olympics right this sort of olympics so this influencer world tour that they seem to all go on uh, but obviously they're part of the industry so it's different um they take the same pictures of the same people the same places the same restaurants the same my plug my friend Friend, my brother all these same captions the proud and it never ends and that's why i think in general maybe this maybe again it's a bit of a stretch but i'm just saying maybe this might explain why the industry even though i love streetwear even though i love sneakers there's not a lot of innovation in that sector is there there's not a lot of people really pushing the envelope and maybe the ones that do that do something fresh no pun intended like a joe fresh good that's why people are so like excited about someone like that and want to jump on his nuts so quickly because there isn't anyone else that's kind of doing it to that exciting level anymore who's kind of bringing some oomph some energy some new ideas some new palettes some new themes some new ideas blah 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 it's just the same old stuff and that might be the reason why because they've got niggas like jerry seinfeld up there these hundred year old motherfuckers that just don't want to move away they don't want to step aside and get the kids room and space again this isn't just a me thing this isn't just me you know 
pleading about this sort of thing so I get the job, which I would love to, don't get me wrong. But it's more so about the kids coming up. If you're into sneakers now and you actually want to be a Nike energy marketing manager or you want to be the creative director or flipping Reebok or whatever, or whatever else place you want to be at or some other brand, imagine how hard it is to get in when you have somebody that looks like this that's over there that's been in the industry since it started. Um, they were flipping in the scene when James Jebbio was a fucking manager of a retail store. They know every single person and every single person that flipping has been around and passed through the fucking industry. They've got all the connections, all the malarkey. It's basically impossible for you to get their job. Impossible, unless they basically drop dead um, for the most part. And they tend to live on forever and ever because they have a flipping easy, quiet life. So it makes complete sense. So when I see stuff like this, it's just a reminder that the scene is kind of full of old old dudes that love this sort of stuff right for them this is like a big deal it makes a lot of sense it kind of connects with their lives and their childhood and whatnot and just kind of you know maybe is a version of themselves that they kind of want to be in the future but i see this and i see lame like especially for kiff there's nothing cool about getting giant stereo signed for a pair of air max 95s and a fleece and a pair of jeans if anything this entire collection this is something i was thinking about the other, the other day if anything for someone like me who kind of rates himself and thinks, you know, I dress pretty well. I think I'm into cool stuff and whatnot. And I'm a little bit of a snob and a little bit up my own ass. I see stuff like this and I automatically think, I don't want to wear anything in this entire look. When I see this look, I think the first thing is, I don't want to see be seen in anything Jerry Seinfeld wears. Not a single bit of it. So this has like the complete opposite effect on me in that regard, a complete opposite. Even though some of the trainers on here aren't collabs, they're just trainers pulled um, to kind of, you know, help with the styling of the absolute thing. And most of the clothing is kiff, but the shoes aren't. It's still, even the shoes are getting a bad rep because Jerry's wearing it. I swear to God, like it doesn't do anything for me in the slightest. And I'm pretty sure the kids who are buying kiff, again, are they, that's, that's the thing, I'm just throwing out assumption. Are kids even buying kiff or is this more a brand for people who are pretty much older? I'm not really too sure, but either way, it doesn't sit right with me. I don't like it. I fucking hate it. I think it looks horrible. It makes kiff look way less cooler than what it actually is if anything it ages kiff really drastically um and maybe that's the whole point of it maybe he wanted to change the positioning the marketing the appeal the communication of kiff and bring it into a more mature sort of kind of realm because it's always been known for like making a lot of kind of athleisure type streetwear type stuff so maybe this is them saying hey we're fully on this kind of like um sports take on j crew type thing that they're doing so if you either like it or you don't but like I said this varsity is pretty decent on the first look book um you know image with this uh, new york jet sort of hat which is pretty nice as well and the nice jeans he has on and whatnot and i'm not sure if the sneakers are a collab or if they're not but regardless this entire look is pretty straight but i'm not wearing anything jerry Seinfeld wears done feeling cool that's never happening never in a million years so i'm not really too sure if that was the right way to go about things but again what do i know Moving on from that, we have, uh, what do we have to talk about here? Yeah, we got this. This is pretty interesting. So, my two worlds have finally collided, right? It seems like. As some of you guys know, I have a show called The Random Show that I do, where I essentially cover a lot of the LA podcast scene type stuff. And I'm sure some of you guys have maybe stumbled across my channel or my podcast because in the early times i used to sometimes talk about some of those things on my podcast but then i realized at the time i don't really want to blend those type things i want to leave the podcast to be more cultural to be more art focused to be more fashion focused be more nightlife focused and the things i'm generally kind of giving a shit about and then of course the comedy stuff i can kind of do on the side so that said i'm obviously really into you know nightlife and dance music and clubbing and DJing and all that sort of stuff and obviously I'm really interested in watching and keeping abreast of all the developments happening in the LA podcast scene because it's like one big reality TV show so it was pretty funny when I saw Andrew Schultz uploaded this little clip that was taken from Blondish the DJ again I'm not really a big fan of hers as a DJ and maybe not as a person as well because she was one of the flipping main culprits of all that flipping nonsense playgrave stuff back in the day and the hypocrisy of her kind of going out there playing and then posting flyers of her going and cleaning beaches it was just flipping annoying and really frustrating and really pissed me off in general that these 
you know, you would call them close to multimillionaire DJs had this idea that, you know, the rules didn't apply to them. They suddenly went and moved over to these fucking third world countries, took advantage of their lack sort of COVID protocols, played and then kind of rubbed it in our faces by showing themselves flipping with a Jesus post, Jesus post, sorry, behind the decks having a whale of a time. So she kind of grinded my gears a little bit. But again, that could be more sort of a thing of me kind of being stuck at home and being frustrated. I can't go outside and then seeing this flipping person person going out and enjoying themselves so maybe it wasn't even her maybe it was more so what she represented that was the issue but regardless she's a dj she's in my world i'm aware of who she is and obviously i'm aware of andrew schultz so it's pretty crazy to see andrew schultz mention her and mention going to see djs and everything that surrounded um the time that he was out and stuff so pretty much of a trip so finally my two worlds have collided so i'm going to play the clip courtesy of andrew schultz's instagram account which is as follows i was all hoodwinked bamboozled duped and double cross and be beguiled by the blondish at burning man nevertheless she's incredible she's brilliant indulging her creations just don't compliment her on mushies on mushrooms i guess let's play the clip dj was so amazing man i've never heard of her she was fucking phenomenal man. i was sober and she was great we went we saw her at one party but then later we saw her in an art car and her and diplo diplo who also fucking crushed her on yeah, that art car great. And for guests of those watching, this is a TikTok clip and it's a clip of Blondish essentially reacting to the video on her TikTok and then obviously Andrew shared it on his um, Instagram account. But she's in the corner eating what looks like to be a, I don't know, mango, a pineapple, I'm not sure, some sort of fruit. They were fucking killing it and I was high and fucking drunk and I tried to bestow a compliment on her. What did I, I mean, I was so stupid. You talked to her? I was like, I was like, you were exceptional. That's right? a nice thing to say. Well, I'm not done. No. And, uh, <laughs> I go, you were exceptional. And then she waits, she kind of looks at me, she says, okay. Now, earlier in the night, when we were watching her at this party in front of the pyramid, it was beautiful, there was like this really vulnerable moment that she had where she was like, um, I really liked you guys. And then she goes, did you guys like me? I love you. Do you love me? Yeah. And then everybody goes, yeah. She goes, okay, I'm just working on my insecurities. I'm working on my insecurities. He sees not insecurities. I see plain old narcissism. That's what I see. Imagine going to a gig and hearing a DJ say, I love you guys. Do you love me? Like how far up your ass do you have to be to say that to a crowd? I say, no, I don't. Play the fucking tune. Press Q, press play or fuck off about do you love me? So I'm approaching her with that energy, right? I'm like, oh, she's like just this brilliantly talented person that also is kind of insecure, maybe in like a social setting. So I want to come in and just make you feel so comfortable. Yeah. So I go, you were exceptional. And she goes, damn, yeah. So so I was like, hold on. You trick me before when I was on the test, Leo. You trick me before when I was screaming. She was brilliant. I was like, it's like you're having a conversation. I was like, you listen to the you listen to the crowd. And what was your favorite part? Anyway, so funny little story and comment and to be honest actually this is something i've actually learned myself especially having covered a lot of dj news a lot of scene stuff and whatnot i've realized over the time that you should never ever 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 go up to a dj and try and talk to them like you're their friend or that you know them or compliment them in any kind of way because some of them are just really socially awkward and usually some of them just don't react well to kind of compliment because I'd imagine like myself also like come and become you know being an up and coming DJ there's this sense of like I won't say guilt but there is this little bit of an imposter syndrome thing with most DJs especially if you're good at what you do especially if you get a lot of you lot get a lot of praise that you're kind of a little bit ashamed that you get that praise because for the most part you're not really doing anything do you know what I mean you're just playing other people's music. Obviously, you're sequencing it well, you're mixing it well, you're reading a crowd, you're creating a story by the sounds that you're playing and soundscapes, all that malarkey. We get it, we get it. But for the most part, you probably don't deserve A, the money or the attention that you're getting based on the skill that you have. It's a bit of a weird one in that respect. But again, people love it. You do your service and it is what it is. But for the most part, that kind of nagging feeling in your head never kind of goes away. So people kind of gas you up and make you feel like you're the you know best thing since sliced bread a normal person with no narcissistic tendencies that isn't a sociopath will probably be like you know what chill relax and not really take it too well but the other people also just generally um sometimes for the most part just don't want to talk to people just don't want to talk to fans they just want to go there they want to play their tune 
They want to hang out in the green room, do their drugs, drink their drinks and go home. They don't want to have any interaction with people, like real interaction. So sometimes when you try to talk to them, it can be a bit weird. They come a bit standoffish or think that they're rude, but it's usually not personal. It's never to do with you. It's more so to do with them in terms of them just being comfortable or being willing to talk to people and fans and whatnot. And I think in general also, when it comes to nightlife and it comes to club culture and whatnot, I always do think that there should always be a bit of a separation between the fans and the artists anyway. And I don't think the artists really deserve that much of a fan base in terms of trying to get to know them. Obviously, you should be their fans in terms of paying tickets to go out and see them and watch their shows, but you shouldn't treat them like you know, pop stars or anything. They're not, there's not that much interesting to get to know about a DJ behind the scenes, especially if you kind of really talk to them personally. It's not really that interesting for the most part. They're just like you, just like you and I, but they just had the courage or the determination to get behind the decks and pursue their dreams that way. But there's nothing that makes them better than you just because they're behind the decks and you're not lesser than them just because you're on the ground dancing and getting your sweat on and so. So which is why I also kind of despise that whole like, behind the DJ culture, even the green room culture, which I've obviously taken a part of in both those things, but I despise that stuff because I feel like it adds a bit of separation. It adds like a hierarchy in terms of like who's the best, who's the coolest, who isn't, and I hate that stuff completely. So usually DJs who kind of indulge in that kind of scene, I hate and I despise, but then the only exception I can think of is someone like a Ricardo Villalobos, who's kind of the king of that whole behind the decks, um, sorry, behind the booth sort of like um, VIP area thing, green room thing, cogs and kisses on the around the decks and whatnot and the kind of oh i know you you don't know me sort of thing like obviously he's a master of it but still he's such such a good dj such an, uh, an incredible iconic figure such a rock star behind the decks that i can't really you know pay attention to that stuff and of course his productions are you know some of his earlier work is out of this world but in general i hate all that sort of stuff so when i hear stories like this as fun and as cool as it is it does remind me in general that you should never ever try to get to know djs especially not as friends especially not as colleagues especially not as a peer especially not as anything you should obviously try your best just to be a fan from afar put a couple of fire emojis say this song is sick what's the idea on this one but that's why it should always stop because for the most part they're all a bit weird to be honest they're not the most um personable people to try to get in touch with and talk to and also i'd imagine it's not really their fault especially if you're like a a, a high caliber dj like a flipping blondish you're getting paid like 30 grand or whatnot you're getting paid to play an hour set somewhere in some tropical location with a really captive audience i think most people you would let that get to your head i think i played a clip on the random show about Jordan Peterson basically acknowledging and accepting that maybe he did let the fame and uh, attention kind of get to him and it has changed him some way. And I think it changes everybody. I think people that don't say it does are naive and a little bit, you know, are just basically liars. I think for the most part, if you're like a DJ who makes it late in life, let's say you make it anywhere between the ages of like 27 and 45, it's going to change you, especially sound now you're kind of quote unquote famous in your little niche. You're getting paid a high amount of money. The booking agencies and the clubs treat you like royalty. They want to take you out for dinner. They want to pay for your transport, make sure you get home. All this kind of stuff that kind of gives you an overinflated sense of self and makes you feel like you're special, which you are, of course, but still makes you feel maybe more special than you think you are. It, of course, it's going to change you, especially considering how people act around you the groupies especially the male groupies i'd imagine probably add to that because they give you a lot of attention they want to talk to you about this talk to you about that so no surprise that people act like that but in general i think this should be a cautionary tale to never try and get friendly with djs ever 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 enjoy the shows enjoy their music um buy the tickets buy the merch um attend 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 but don't try to communicate or get to know them in any way shape or form because you will get made to look like a fool if you try and say hi and you know try and be personable and stuff it won't end well i guarantee you it won't end well okay anyway moving on from that one what should we talk about here? Bear with me a second. I talk about that already, haven't I? Um, yeah, I thought this is interesting to talk about. Let's talk about this a little bit. So this is courtesy of Glock Topics, and it features an article, or a little, sorry, it features an Instagram post taken from the artist known as Young Blue, who I think a few guys might be familiar with. And he is potentially is um, celebrating this latest win where he was able to buy himself a private jet that he's obviously going to be using to kind of fly around the country, maybe fly around the world. I'm not too sure if these jets can fly around the world. I'm not really too sure if that's the case. But regardless, he got himself a private jet. And I thought it was a pretty cool thing to see on the timeline because he shared a quite touching little story. I'm going to read about it also. But I quickly went to mention, the reason why I thought this was quite cool is because as much as I think the whole like private jet thing that rappers promote 
is a little bit corny and lame because some of them try to make give the impression that they own the jet when they don't and they're leasing it and usually to lease a jet or just to get it to fly you a short distance you know last minute.com can cost anywhere between like fifty thousand dollars to half a million depending on where you want to go and how you know the, how urgent the emergency is so it's not really something that is um you would describe uh financially um, advisable in terms of doing in terms of spending your money so it's not the great thing to do but a lot of rappers like to floss and like to stunt on Instagram so it makes sense why they do it and I've also learned that a lot of these private um, jet places and companies and whatnot they'll sometimes reach out to rappers and artists and get them to basically promote what they do by advertising that they were on their jet and stuff so sometimes it can work out good for rappers because you could mean you could have like a free flight for you and your team but then the airplane company or the private jet firm whatever it may be have the ability to now promote and get their stuff out to people who kind of want to be like you and live that life also and then there's a sad dog bit of it of that service that they have where you can go to a studio and sit into a side of studio and take pictures of yourself that uh, makes you look like you're in a private jet that's also really sad but in general i think this is really cool because this is one of the younger rappers on the industry now and on, on the scene at the moment who's going out there and buying himself a private jet even if he's not buying it at all flower and cash he's obviously buying it in some level of installments i just think it's good to kind of have someone out there who's maybe rewriting the narrative a little bit and adding something different to what people are doing in terms of hey we're buying cars we're buying this um, studios we're buying lean we're doing this we're buying drugs it's nice to see him maybe investing in something that he feels is going to add something to his career now the only thing that I'm, I'm a little bit dubious about is that if you're a young blue and you're a up-and-coming artist you know he's done a lot of work behind the scene but he's an up-and-coming artist on his own right would you think paying what he's paying now to own this jet would it be actually be something that will end up you know um paying him back in the end because i'd imagine if you're paying it off you're gonna have to justify that by saying you're gonna be flying a certain amount but is he getting booked as much as as much as it would mean he's getting paid to pay the installments you get what i mean so if he's paying installments of like five hundred thousand a month let's say right to kind of pay off this jet you'd have to obviously make sure he shows that he's performing at for the month are going to clear that to make that make sense um but i don't know if he's obviously doing that but that's obviously a pocket walking thing so who fucking cares but let's move on to the caption i thought the caption was really sweet let's read that because that was the most interesting part about it, it says as follows it's courtesy of um uh blue vandross of course is his instagram account name it says nobody know where your life can take you it took me 10 hard years to get here where where can i start i used to daydream all day when i lived with my mama i used to tell people every day i'ma be successful some people believed some didn't i just kept going on my road to success i fell off about four or five times lost a lot of loved ones gave a lot of money but blowed a lot of it too but i don't regret it i helped a lot of people at the same time i never hated on nobody never said i deserved more than another man's success always played my role stayed humble stayed a humble beast hits i'm resilient um can't be defeated i pulled myself up every single time i'm proud of myself you fucking beast which is great to see right him actually giving himself these kind of great affirmations he says not to even own not to even be owning a car to owning a plane which is a crazy flex he doesn't own a car but he's got a plane which is fucking crazy i love that sort of energy which is what i want to do with myself when i end up getting my flipping tesla or Yam lamborghini urus Whoa. imagine that as a first car mental it continues to not even owning a car to owning a plane i can't afford to buy a, a corbin diapers now to owning my own private jet from alabama Man, I broke barriers. I'm already a goat in my state. When I was young in the game, I didn't know what being an artist v businessman was. A lot of these people don't understand the moves I make behind closed doors. I'd just be letting y'all flex, but man, I had to post this. I'm posting this to motivate the young guns, uh, the young guys, sorry, long-term investment, money boy jets, moon boy something, humble beast, and most importantly, album on the way. So clearly this is something that's a long play. There's other things in the works behind the scenes that he's also working on to make it make sense but regardless i love the fact that he's just promoting this sort of energy and putting this all out there that it is possible if you wanted to own your actual own jet instead of leasing it and also it's a cool little flex to actually have your own jet in it why not if everyone's out there getting lamborghinis and ferraris and whatnot why not go out there and get your own jet especially you have the possibility to do so especially during the beginning of your career when all the money and the funds are rolling in i love that energy i love that energy then i also went to play talking about energy I went to play this clip, right? Talking about energy, I went to play this clip. 
Yeah, talk about energy. I wanted to play this clip, right? Because I wanted to play this clip. I wanted to play this clip. Now, this is a clip taken from um, the Emmys, which were on earlier today. And it features a nominee called Cheryl Lee Ralph, who most of you will be familiar with from her recent work in elementary, but many, many other things prior. But I thought this was really touching and kind of spoke about the creative journey and the kind of things that you kind of long for when you're kind of on your journey and what success actually means and what it actually looks like. And I think this is something that I can, can kind of hold dear to where I'm trying to go and the things I'm trying to do. So this is Cheryl Lynn, um, sorry, this is Cheryl Lee Ralph talking to people, um, obviously um, regarding outside the Emmys, regarding some advice that she got from Robert De Niro 20 years ago. I have to tell you this, one day I was shooting a movie with Robert De Niro, the great Robert De Niro, and in between shots, he looked at me and he said, you are great. He said, like, you're like really DGA, damn great actress. <laughs> but Hollywood's not looking for you. They are not looking for the black girl. So you better wave that red flag and let them know you're here because you deserve to be seen. Wow. 30 wow. years later, I am seen yes. with my Emmy go. nomination. <laughs> and thank God I didn't give up on me because it's been a rough climb but it's worth every step i have to tell you and i honestly do think myself included that's the main thing any creative or any person pursuing a career in the arts or in entertainment especially the ones that aren't you know i'm i'm talking about these careers because they're the ones that aren't that um there is no linear path to success it always a bit windy and shit right there's no kind of a bits of advice you can get i think i spoke about reason recently in another video or another kind of podcast where I was talking about getting advice from people when you're in the arts or entertainment industry is a bit useless because everyone's journey is different you just have to kind of stay on the path and just hope and pray that over time you will be rewarded or you will be put into the right places and you can then show out and prove and kind of take your chances with both hands but I think in general most artists myself included the most thing that most of us want, especially when you're in a grind and no one notices you and you don't get any attention and you're kind of just grinding in the background is people to notice. That's the main thing you actually do want. Like the noticing thing is actually the win. And of course, you know, later on, um, what's her name? Um, Cheryl Lee Ralph ended up winning an Emmy for her work in elementary. And I think maybe a couple more later on in the night. But she said clearly the fact that she got nominated was already the win. Because now it kind of solidifies you that you belong in the room, that you are now part of this, you know, um, sacred group of people who have touched and impacted culture to the point where they're celebrating at these kind of rewards. But obviously, once you get in there, human nature, it then kind of makes you feel like that's not enough. You need more. You need to win. You need to make, if you, can't, if you win one, you have to win two. If you win two, you have to win three or four or five. It goes up and up. But usually when you're starting, when you're just grinding and you're just kind of doing things haphazardly on your own DIY style, all you want is a small victory. You want the ability, especially for me when I was first DJing, the first thing that I kind of was really adamant that I did, especially when I made a decision to kind of step away from trying to play at kind of trendy clubs, I was like, cool, if I can't get to play at trendy clubs, what I want to do is I want the ability to just play every weekend. When I play every weekend, the idea behind it was to make sure that I can play in front of a crowd so I can know what that feels like because I usually, I'm used to playing in like, you know, by myself at home or playing in venues where no one's there. So it's better to play in front of a crowd even if they're not paying attention just so you've got the ability to perform in front of people i held eye contact to make sure you're having fun all that good stuff and just be somewhat professional behind the decks um and obviously i did that and then the idea behind that was that once i did that and gained that confidence that would then allow me to go out and then start pitching myself out to the place that i actually do want to play later on down the line but i need to have like a core grounding and that meant playing every weekend and that was for me a success that for me felt like i was playing every weekend at panorama bar when i was playing in these pubs and bars i took it seriously i prepared my sets um for the longest time i think maybe for the first six months i never ever played the same set twice always changed it up always downloading new songs listening to new stuff record digging all that good stuff right and in the end it ended up paying dividends because i was getting books all the time people liked me um they liked my company they liked how i treated staff um the vibe i brought you know how good i did my job bloody blah, blah 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 and that was a win but obviously as i started doing it more my kind of um goals aspirations became a bit more lofty and i started to maybe look down on the thing that i had and then just as i was looked down and again think about how the universe works just as i started to look down on the situation that i had covid hit 
and then COVID hit and completely scuppered that entire little gig I had that whole entire opportunities that we usually would have in terms of playing in certain places completely evaporated and now I'm at a point where I don't necessarily play out regularly anymore as much as I did prior because those places where I played out have now maybe moved on and decided to get other people or maybe they thought you know we could just get away with having just a Spotify place and they could do a better job who knows but it's funny how the universe works and it's funny how your kind of um what do you call it your goals and your aspirations change based on the things that you achieve and it can sometimes be a little bit of a of a double-edged sword you end up achieving something and then it ends up kind of making you want to achieve more but then that could also make you not grateful for the things that you already have achieved so it's great to hear somebody as kind of you know um celebrated well-regarded and legendary as Cheryl Lee Ralph say you know for her just to get noticed by the Emmys was enough of a win doesn't matter if she wins or doesn't and I think that's the same for me the fact that I'm able to still get some level of attention the stuff that I do is great but the really kind of fundamental thing that I want going forward especially for my DJ career is the ability to play in like cool places on the you know for every weekend let's say right in cool clubs and bars and places where people will kind of want to hear me play certain type of music every single weekend everything else will be a bonus doesn't matter if it's high profile low profile mid profile everything else is a bonus so i think in general in life we should kind of keep that sort of mindset in terms of you know what's the bare minimum that will make you happy what's the bare minimum that would be a win what uh, you know especially if you're in it for the love if you're in it for the love it wouldn't really matter because i guess if you aren't in it for the love emmys are important because they're going to boost your profile like to get bigger roles land bigger marketing deals blah 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 but if you're in it for the love you know that just having the ability to be or just just having the possibility that your peers recognize you and want you in that room it's good because it validates your work but it also doesn't change anything you can still go back and continue doing your stuff they did prior so i really really did like that message from cheryl lee ralph moving on from that um what else we have here yeah, it is quite interesting this is courtesy again <clears throat> from hype beast and i'm going to have another article here courtesy or, or page post courtesy of vans now it looks like um courtesy of hype beast that dime have linked up with vans to create this pretty cool half cab right um it kind of looks like the upper is made up of a combination of new buck or maybe suede i'm not too sure which one is which um i'm gonna say this is new buck and then it's also got um so it's like a cream i'd say new buck on the upper with cream laces and then the entire midsole is black with a black lining and then it's got the dime um embossed here at the back of the hill and it's got a pretty cool hang tag also that i wouldn't actually mind letting hang off the side of a vans but it's a bit lame to have that oh and the bottom of the sole of the dime um half cabs obviously has dime written on there on the underneath as well has one of the best fonts in it that dime font i'm not too sure what it is is it time new romans i don't know what sure is that an updated vans silhouette half cab the toe is really interesting how they changed it. Maybe it is updated, isn't it? Right, the mud guard in the toe box definitely looks a little updated. And you know what they've done, which I'm really happy about. The first time ever I've seen this in a shoe. Oh my god, they've absolutely laced them properly. It's something that I always have a real, you know, it always kind of pisses me off when I see product shots from Nike and Adidas where they never relace their shoes. They actually relace their shoes here. They relace it. Look over under over under left and then on this side over under right it's a really nitpicky sneakerhead thing if you're not a sneakerhead you wouldn't know wouldn't care but essentially this is how your laces should be looking um you should have the ability to have do that kind of is it like a z pattern in terms of the lace but the lace on the left hand side it should always be on the top um and then the lace on the right hand side going the z way should be on the top as well if you get what i mean it's really hard to say if you're not watching the podcast or watching this clip but essentially that's what a relay shoe looks like so that's pretty cool to see but then on the other side of things did i just get rid of it there i did didn't know the other side of things um Vans have also done a collaboration with Free Skate Mag for a pair of half cabs that look exactly the same. But essentially, the only difference is that I guess the label on the side is black. And of course, the sole is... Oh, sorry. And the tone of the brand is completely different too. It feels like the tone of this brown on the Vans Free Skate Mag is a little bit more of like a Carhartt type brown, if that makes complete sense. And then, the, of course, the dime one is a little bit more washed out in terms of it so maybe it's a bit more of a khaki-ish type thing i'm not really sure how to describe the overall color of it um it might actually say in the product description let's see in the text let's say what the text is what color is meant to be um it's an oxford tan hue okay oxford tan so maybe that makes a lot more sense so maybe it's an oxford tan hue in that for the dimes and then for the fans free skate mag edition 
it's more of a Carhartt brown, I'd say, in terms of the appeal. But it's not Carhartt material, it's still suede. But then it's got contrasting stitching also. Um, the dime one has, um, what you call it? Has a, the stitching is the same kind of yeah, I forgot what the term is for that actually, what it's called. But it's gen generally, they're still the same shoe. So the thing I was really to bring this up is that you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily see this happen too often where a sneaker company or a shoe company will have a collaboration or have even a shoe model that kind of looks eerily similar to another model that they have coming out as well. It doesn't really happen too often. I know the Vans Free Skate Max shoes are already out. That already came out, I'm pretty sure, recently. Maybe it was like the 9th of September or something. Another kind of, what is it? Yeah, the 9th of September. That already dropped. When did the Dime One release? The Dime One's coming out next week. So interesting that they've done that, right? They've got two shoes that are completely the same um, that are going to be available at kind of the same sort of time in terms of the months, whatnot. And if I had to pick gun to my head, which one I'd take, it'd definitely be the Dime. I think the Dime colorway and just to finish with that new buck is just a lot more buttery smooth. It feels a lot more fresh. But then I'm still not mad at this free skate mag version of it. Also, I wouldn't be mad at not having of having these easy. Oh, okay, and also the obviously the tongue is different too because the laces are black and the tongue is black. Uh, but then on the on the dime one, the tongue is also um, cream or that kind of Oxford tan. But yeah, pretty much two very similar shoes done by the same shoe company with two different collaborators and they're releasing it at the same time it doesn't happen usually if they have a conflict of interest or there's too much similarity they'll usually delay one um and then kind of release it further down the line um which then goes to people like myself saying oh see these brands all the same they always take collaborators work and kind of just regurgitate it out in a gr in a different sort of execution different patterns and colors and whatnot and finishes but these are clearly two separate ideas from two different collaborators. And it's just coincidence that their guests are on the same model too, actually, which is crazy. Maybe it's not a coincidence. Maybe it is like a um, overall celebration of the half cap. I'm not really too sure. It might be. It might be because because they do that quite often, isn't it? Like shoe companies will have a, a big shoe and then just or a really kind of popular model. And then they'll have all these different collaborators come and just basically do their interpretation of what their shoe should look like or what they, the perfect shoe for them will look like in that model. So that makes complete sense. But yeah, I love the Dime one. I love the Vanscape Mag one, but if I had to choose, it would definitely be the Dime. If I had to go for it just because of that clear icy sole with the Dime written on the bottom, the really lush finish on the new buck or suede, whatever is on the top here. This checkered hill tab is a nice little addition. The dime embossed on the back here was really beautiful too. And also oh, it looks like it's embossed too on this bit, that half cap sign, which is different here than the one on the Vans um, free skate mag one edition. That sign there is like a stitch label. It looks like more like, yeah, like the classic half cap. Okay, cool. So that's cool to see. And of course the, Dime release shoes meant to be coming out when on the 22nd. So you can expect to hit that all your kind of regular retailers. So definitely keep an eye out for it if you're interested in that one. Then we have news courtesy of Supreme. Supreme, my favorite streetwear brand in the world. Um, definitely up there. It says here, courtesy of their website, Supreme Nike. This fall, Supreme has worked with Nike on an ACG collection consisting of a denim pullover, fleece pullover, pant short jersey, and spring summer top and six panel made exclusively for Supreme. The ACG denim pullover, belted denim and pant, and denim pant feature a resistant, water resistant, sorry, Cordura cotton denim. The ACG, oh, really? Cotton denim that's water resistant. Interesting. The ACG fleece pullover features Polar Tech. Um, fleece and nylon ripstop panels while the HEG um, trail short features water resistant nylon the HEG jersey features poly drift jersey um, while the HEG grid T features cotton jersey they're going to be available on the 15th so this week on Thursday and Japan on the 17th more importantly the images now this fleece pullover thing is absolutely banging especially in this sort of like um, uh, leopardy type is it leopard? No, it's not. It's actually just an S. I don't know. It looks quite leopardy. I don't know what it is, but regardless of what it is, it looks absolutely fire. I also like the fact that in the photo shoot for these um, ACG collab, they've got the models to wear ACGs, which is a nice little touch. You don't know, so you see that happen too often, especially some of the models that have been released nowadays. A lot of people don't seem to like in general, but I do like this. Um, the denim suit is not really for me. I think this looks 
definitely the worst um, iteration of the entire thing but i do like the fact that this looks like a denim suit but it's also water resistant and it's also made by atg so it's also meant to be worn outdoors in the mountains but it looks like something you could wear at a flipping mtv music festival do you know what i mean mtv music mtv mtv sorry video music awards not music festival you know what i meant you know what i meant and yeah the classic hg there in the black with the gloves on are the gloves part of it i don't think they are either but those gloves look fucking hard um and obviously the banner clava but yeah this is my favorite piece that jacket in this kind of snake skin um sort of pattern is absolutely fire and i'm sure that's going to be one of the most popular things to sell look at that picture man with the colors like that looks beautiful i wonder who took the picture for this who took the photography they never share that do they supreme who took the pictures for it um but that looks hard as hell that kind of snake and obviously that top as well is a top that's like got panels on it acg panel kind of reminds you of like an old um soccer jersey or cycling jersey it looks really nice you got this really bright fluorescent pink there and this neon yellow kind of lime green sort of effect on the body the pants that go with the jacket that i like the sort of snake skin is really nice again addition of wearing kind of mainline acg shoes is really nice i'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie beat scene and wearing converses and flipping dusty vans all the time that denim pullover thing i'm not a fan of at all we've got a good little t-shirt there but yeah this is the denim pullover thing which is not for me in the slightest let's move on from there this is obviously the best that snake skin pattern obviously the pullover is really decent it probably is better in the black but then the jacket in that sort of same print is definitely the pierce de resistance for me um where is it let me see skip let's continue i want to see where that jacket is in this collection what's it called it's called a nike fleece pullover that's definitely one of my favorites as well and it's definitely got a little little snood um a little face mark thing that you can pull over that comes up right up until your nose which is really really hard um where's the jacket can i please see the jacket please sir where is it they got the pant here did i miss the jacket maybe i missed it maybe that was what i saw earlier i'm not really too sure I've got the trousers here that I'm checking also. Some shorts that look really nice. I've never owned a pair of Supreme shorts, but they seem to do them. They seem to have a real wide range of shorts that they put out every season, but I've never owned one pair, not one. Um, if I'm not mistaken, didn't um, Brendan Babs in when he was at um, Supreme, didn't he make one of his first corduroy shorts there? before he jumped onto doing it. No, I'm pretty sure. I'm not too sure that's true. I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure. I think that might be the story I heard once before. The first little iteration of a corduroy short that he did, like a sports shorts. Because imagine, imagine someone trying to float the idea to you that they're going to make a pair of sports shorts or shorts that are best for like, you know, surfing, but they're going to be made out of corduroy. You wouldn't really understand what they were talking about. You think they're flipping high off mud or something, but yeah, he did that and it made it work. Um, but yeah, I can't see the jacket jacket I was looking for that's in that lookbook. Maybe it was something, maybe it was that um, that pullover thing that I saw. Maybe that was what I saw. Yeah, maybe it's a pullover. No, that's a pullover. There, and I think I'm talking about that jacket there in other colours. This one, yeah. So I think that's the one that I saw before. And that's called the, uh, I forgot what the name of it is called actually. Let me see if I can get back up on here before we move on, which is called the denim pullover, right? So it's called the pullover just in general. Or no, is that a different one? Maybe it's a different one. I think it's just a pullover. I think so. It's just a pullover. That definitely is the one. So yeah, look eager to see what the prices are for this going forward. But I really like the collab. I like again that Nike. Sorry, the Supreme always try something interesting and new when it comes to Nike collaborations. I like the fact that they tapped into ACG actually, especially when you think about the ties to New York. Um, you know, low lives and all that jazz and all that. You know, the extension of sneakerheads in general, when ACG and all that stuff, it makes a lot of sense that they'd be tapping into that scene. And generally, do like it. I genuinely do like it. So, um, what else we have here? We did the Kiff stuff already. We spoke about that. We spoke about this. I think I've spoken about quite a few bits already. You know, I think I might have to leave it there for now. That might be the end. Yeah, I think that might be it because I've touched most things. So that has been the Agassino Zynga Show episode number 600. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. Um, thanks for everybody who's been hanging in on there with me when it comes to these episodes and, you know, me rambling about nonsense topics that most of you probably don't give a shit about. Thanks anyway for tuning in and pretending that you do care. That's much appreciated. And as per usual, I'll see you guys again very soon. If you're listening to this via the 
And as per usual, I'll see you guys again very soon. So if you listen to this stuff via, um, and obviously I'll see you guys again soon, innit? If you listen to this video, if you listen to this via an audio platform, obviously you will hear the tune of the day from me. And if you're watching this via YouTube, unfortunately it will just end and it'll fade to black, but thanks again. But yeah, man, but thanks again for tuning in. 600 episodes, Um, finally, finally, we're there. We hit that milestone. Nothing, no crazy, crazy celebrations, but still good to kind of acknowledge it. So thanks for, you know, being there for me in terms of fans, in terms of listeners, in terms of just not giving a shit and just checking in and being nosy. For whatever reason you're here, I appreciate you. Thanks for checking me out. And, you know, hopefully I'll able to reach 600 more episodes God willing and my health is intact, I'll of course keep doing these as long as possible. But thanks again for checking me out. Really do appreciate it. Of course, if you listen to the audio version of this podcast, you hear my tune of the day. If you're watching this via YouTube, you won't hear anything. It'll just fade to black, but it still matters anyway. It still matters. Take care. Be safe, guys. Peace.